Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Well, here we are in the new year. I, I pray and hope that you had a blessed transition from the old year into the new year. And I hope you are looking forward in the days to come as you serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's so good to be here. I look forward to our time together in these uh, new days that we're facing in this year. I look forward not only to the uh, time together, but also to the uh, preparation and all that it takes to bring to you, um, hopefully, uh, a message that will bless you, and not only bless you, but grow you in your grace and knowledge, and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So I want to bring in, bring, uh, uh, start with, uh, with a fellow by the name of Henry, Eric Henry Liddell. He was born, uh, Eric was born in January 16th, 1902, to Scottish missionaries in uh, China. He would spend his early years at the boarding school near London and then move on to the University of Edinburgh. And along with his studies, Eric was a gifted athlete who would find a spot on Scotland's national rugby team, where according to sports writers, Eric demonstrated his, quote, rare combination, pace and the gifts of rugby brains and hands. And not only did Eric possess brains and hands for rugby, his greatest asset was his speed. And it was his speed that, w that would one day find him representing Great Britain and his, in his own country as well, uh, Scotland, at the 1924 Summer Olympics in Paris, France. Long story short, Eric would go on to win the gold medal in the 400 meter race, breaking the Olympic and world records at that time with a time of 47.7, 47, pardon me, 0.6 seconds. That's pretty fast. It's been broken since, of course. But not long after, though, Eric uh, would return to China to serve as a missionary from 1925 until his death in, on February 21st, 1945. It was during the year 1943 when the Japanese Imperial uh, Army overran the mission station where Eric was serving, and they sent him to the Weissen internment camp. And during his internment, Eric uh, would serve others, he would help the elderly, he would teach Bible lessons. Of course, he would arrange sporting events, being the sporting athlete he was, and teaching uh, the kids science. And it was said of Eric, quote, he was overflowing with good humor and love for life. It's a rare, it is rare indeed that a person has good fortune to meet a saint, but he came close to it as anyone I have known. And Eric Henry Liddell died of an inoperable brain, tr brain tumor on February 21st, 1945, at the age of 43, five days before the camp was liberated. And of course, uh, the, the movie Chariots of Fire in 1980s uh, was written based on the life of Eric Henry Liddell. Well, friends, today is the first day of 2023. 2022 is in the books. It's all said and done. It's history. Today's the first day of 2023 that will bring to you and to me new experiences and, of course, new challenges. We will have a variety of opportunities that will come our way each, every day. And along with this comes the unknown. And truth be told, none of us can know for sure what will happen in one hour from now, let alone tomorrow. Eric Henry Liddell reminds us that life can be lived one of two ways for ourselves or for God. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, Eric reminds us, metaphorically speaking, that each of us has been given a race to run for Christ. Someone put it this way so well, quote, you have a race to run. It's a race you've been given, and not one you have chosen. So please turn in your Bibles to the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, and we will begin in verse 1, and we'll read through to the end of verse 4. Chapter 12, verse 1 of Hebrews. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with the endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, 
so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted the point of shedding your blood. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, our Father, we thank you for this new year that we have right here with us, 2023. We're here, right here at the beginning. We ask God that you would take us through this year, strengthen us, mold us and shape us to be more like your son, Jesus, so that you would be glorified in all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin now, uh, let's begin by building a foundation uh, around this letter to the Hebrews. Uh, we will need some historical and thematic context to help our understanding concerning this holy inspired letter. And more specifically, the, the verses that we're dealing with this morning, 1 to 4, and more, even more specifically, 1 and 2. Uh, with this background and this little foundation that we're going to try and build here, it will help us to understand how these verses apply to us today after so many years after the book, the letter was written. First, uh, we asked the question, who was the audience that the author Hebrews was writing to? Of course, in your modern day uh, translations, uh, the very obvious clue that we have, we have that title or that heading before the letter begins, the letter to the Hebrews. Now, that's a pretty obvious cue. Uh, clue. But secondly, as you read through the letter carefully, it quickly becomes apparent that the author knows his Old Testament. He really does. Uh, he compares the ministry of Jesus Christ to the Old Testament covenant to make his point that Jesus Christ is not only greater than Moses or, the, or Aaron or the priesthood of Israel, but Jesus Christ has fulfilled all the duties of prophet, priest, and king perfectly. And with these two clues, we can reasonably conclude that the primary audience of Hebrews were Jewish Christians. I don't think it's too hard to, to get there. A closer reading of Hebrews uh, con, um, also reveals that the author was deeply concerned that some of the Jewish brothers and sisters in the Lord were experiencing some difficult and serious spiritual threats. So what was happening in their context that this letter addresses? Well, we start with chapter 1, and there the author establishes the supremacy of God the Son, that is Jesus Christ, in chapter 1. And then he begins with some warnings against those who might be neglecting their salvation in Christ for a variety of reasons, possibly. We read in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest, lest we drift away from it. Drift away from what? Drift away from their salvation in Christ, their trust in Christ. Chapter 3, we, we find more of these reminders to the faithful uh, followers of Christ, or as Hebrews puts it uh, in 3.6, we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And here in chapter 3, the concern was that some, due to their circumstances, would harden their hearts as they once did long ago. And this is the author reaching way back into the history of Israel during the 40 years of desert wandering. Uh, their punishment for disobeying God for not entering into the promised land. And we read in chapter 3, verse 7 and following, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Here the author of Hebrews is quoting Psalm 90, 95, verse 7 to 11. So whatever was happening to these Jewish Christians was a major concern for the author of Hebrews, for he feared as they would drift and harden their hearts towards Christ, this would result in their disobedience. And we see him state this in chapter 4, verse 11, let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience, the same sort of disobedience as their forefathers did when they were told to cross into the promised land. But this leaves us with one more question to ask. What is the date of this letter? When was this letter written? And you might be asking, why is that important, Pastor? And that's a good question. But I, I believe if we can figure out a bit about the date, it will help us with another why question. Why was the author so concerned with his brothers, his Jewish brothers and sisters in the Lord that he would write them a letter? 
And of course, we don't have the time to do a comprehensive study here. Yet the context that we find in the letter and in the New Testament whole gives us some potential clues. And I say all that to say this, that for today, the date that I would consider, or at least that we should consider, uh, would be prior to 70 AD, which is probably the most likely best choice. And I would actually uh, date this letter just prior to the Roman persecution of Christians in Rome by the Emperor Nero. So that would put a date on this letter just prior to 64 or 65 AD. Now, of course, you can do your own homework. You can disagree maybe with me on that. But the point is this. This helps us understand why this letter was written to Jewish Christians. Because they were most likely living near or in Rome prior to Nero's full-on persecution. The temptation for Jewish Christians at this time, coming under this increasing persecution from the Romans, was the return to Judaism. You see, Judaism was one of the many religions that Rome uh, sanctioned and accepted and allowed those people to practice their faith. But Christianity was another thing altogether in this first century setting. It was not accepted or was not supported, certainly, and often it was attacked by the Romans, let alone the Jews themselves as well. So with this thing, these things in mind, the author of Hebrew writes his letter to Jewish Christians suffering from increasing Roman persecution. And if you want to drop the Roman, that's fine. They were definitely suffering from increasing persecution. Hebrews was written to encourage and remind Jewish Christians, as it is written in Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Well, now we can turn our attention to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And let's look at verse 1. Let's read that together again. Verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So the first thing I want us to notice in this verse, it begins with the conjunction, therefore. We could also say consequently, or for which reason. This, therefore, connects our text with chapter 11. And I want to be a little more specific because it also connects us with a major theme that begins in chapter 10, verse 19, works right through chapter 11 to our text here in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 12. And the question is, what is this theme? Well, the, que the answer is faith, faith in God. But I want to go back to the point that was made at the beginning. As, you know, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we have been recruited to run a race. It's not an option. It's not, get, it's not take it or leave it. It has been given to you and me when we surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ. And so I can just say to all who are hearing this and watching this, welcome to the kingdom team. So first things first, what we have here in verse 1 is clearly a metaphor. A metaphor that the Apostle Paul often used in his letters. And let's turn to chapter 9 of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And in that chapter, we see Paul defending his apostleship from those within the Corinthian church that were challenging his leadership. They had some other major issues going on, but they were certainly challenged, challenging Paul on his apostleship. And throughout his defense, Paul always states, or at least states here in chapter 9, verse 23, that he has only one reason for all that he does as an apostle. I do it for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. And then with his very next breath, Paul said this, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. We can also go to Paul's Philippian letter, where we read, well, where we read, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. So we have these uh, places in Paul's letters where he talks about a race and pressing on toward a goal. I want to go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, and in that, um, that chapter, Amongst a few other things, Luke uh, tells of those that came to Jesus and said some things to him. One of them said uh, this to Jesus, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. 
That was in Luke chapter 9, verse 59. And another one came up to Jesus and said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And that's Luke 9, 61. Then Jesus replied, no one puts his hand to the plow. No one, pardon me, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, here we have an inclination here of these uh, ones that want to follow Jesus, sort of stumbling and fumbling here at the very beginning. Well, there are many other places when we think of Paul's letters that we'll find references to the Christian life compared to an athletic context. The metaphor that the author is using here in verse 1 in Hebrews 12 is, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And this metaphor of a race fits the reality of a follower of Jesus Christ today. The question that each one needs to answer, each of us who profess to be Christian, is the same one someone else once asked. Will you embrace your race or keep trying to escape it? Have you ever said to yourself, I wouldn't have chosen this race if given a choice? Have you actually said that? I certainly wouldn't have picked this team and this coach. Don't like them that much, maybe, I don't know. And hasn't anybody noticed that there's a better trail to run this race than the one we're on right now? But yet here you are on the first day of 2023, just like myself, with a race before you that was chosen for you. Are you ready to run? Or are you going to keep trying to escape it? So as we look here at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we find how to run our race, and not only how to run our race, but how to run it well. First notice this phrase with me, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Well, look at that, another metaphor, great cloud of witnesses. The word therefore points to this great cloud of witnesses that we find in chapter 11. So the question, how does this help our race? Well, friends, we can learn from other great runners. We can learn from other great runners. Of course, your race and my race is uniquely ours. It's given to you by God. But others have experienced temptations like we all have. Others have experienced the same emotions in that race that you've experienced. There are similar challenges which are common to all racers in this Christian life. The Apostle Paul reminds us that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And God has been so wonderful to us that he's given us this Bible and he's given us each other, which provides us great examples of others which we can learn from. We can learn to run the race well from others. Next, notice the phrase, let us lay aside every weight and sing sin which clings closely. While I was on the internet the other day, I, I, I asked this question, what to wear for a marathon? And I found a website, runtofinish.com, that gave me some suggestions. The primary concern for running a marathon, and, and I didn't even have to look this up, I knew this, I know that because I've ran uh, shorter races, not necessarily marathons. Um, the primary concern uh, on, a, on running a marathon and the gear to wear is really the weather situation on the day of the run. Is it cold? Is it hot? Is it raining? Etc. Etc. And once you sort that out, then you pick the running gear you will race, use on that race day. The text here gives us some sound advice as we run our faith race. It says, lay aside every weight. Or to put it another way, run as light as possible. The original language for the phrase lay aside means to put off, to put aside, to put away. You may not like the race that's before you as you move into 2023. Maybe you're resentful toward God for the race. Why, oh God, did you give me this race? Nevertheless, this race has been chosen for you. It is not meant to hinder you, but to free you, to run free, to run fast, and to run for joy. We can just look at chapter 11. Here are some runners we can learn so much from. They didn't know all that lay ahead of them in their race. Matter of fact, chapter 11 reminds us that all these in chapter 11, all that are listed in chapter 11, although commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, 1139. 
yet they ran the race, according to the author of Hebrews, by faith. You see this in Hebrews 11, this phrase, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Enoch, by faith, etc., etc. For as verse 6 in chapter 11 reminds us that without faith, it's impossible to please him, that is God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So lay aside every weight of your disappointments. You're a pie in the sky dreaming and fantasies and stuff like that. Lay aside putting your hope in the temporary nature of this world and its agenda. Lay aside all your regrets. Have no regret. Lay them all aside. And the sin that can tie up your feet and make you stumble and fumble along the way. Friends, Jesus paid for all your sins once for all. Or as the writer of Hebrews put it in Hebrews 10.10, 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Friends, run as light as possible. Now we have another phrase here in verse 1. Let us run with endurance the race that is before us. This text is exhorting you and me to run with endurance. Hebrews chapter 10 through 6 points out that endurance in the Christian race is essential. It is needed. It is essential. For we read in, in chapter 10 through 6, the first part of that verse, for you have need of endurance. And then the question is why? Well, it's answered in the second part of verse 36. So that, you, so that when you have done the will of God, you may, you may receive what is promised. So the question is this then, how does one increase their endurance? Well, there's really only one way, by training hard, by pushing your limits. Everyone that is listed in Hebrews 11 had no idea how they would accomplish what God asked them to do. Yet they put one foot in front of the other. Every morning they got up, they put their faith in God who would accomplish all that he said he would in and through them even if they never realized this in their lifetime. Their endurance would increase one day at a time. Through each challenge that each day brought, one day at a time, their endurance would grow and grow. We have again the great example of the Apostle Paul. As we read through his 13 letters in the New Testament, we find someone who was faced with more than his fair share of challenges as he brought the gospel to so many places in the known world at the time and so many people. And as he was drawing uh, closer to the end of his life, he wrote a letter to his dear friend Timothy, 2 Timothy, and he said this in that letter, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the type, time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Run with endurance, my dear friends. Run with endurance. Well, the year, pardon me, the year was uh, 2005. The month was January. I was playing the gold medal game of the small unit ball hockey tournament at the Garrison. At the age of 46, I was one of the oldest players on the team. Yet the coach trusted me with the defensive side of our team. I played really hard. I pursued hard. I checked hard. I ran hard. I passed the ball hard. The only thing I had in my mind was the prize. Not so much the gold medal, but the bragging rights. The right to say we won the gold medal against all odds. Well, 18 years have come and gone since January 2005. Truth be told, it is just a memory. The game and the gold medal long forgotten. And one day, every single one of us who played so hard and won the bragging rights on that day, we will all die, long forgotten in the annuals of time. So I want to ask you this question. What prize are you striving for in 2023? What have you set your sights on in 2023? May I suggest what the writer to the, of the letter of Hebrews uh, said here in verse 2? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Friends, you have a race to run. It's a race you've been given, not one you have chosen. So learn from the great faith runners of the past. Run as light as possible. Run with endurance. 
and keep your eyes on the prize, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that we are in a race. A race that you have given to us. And I thank you for it, Lord. Well, it's not going to be easy. Uh, there's no rose-colored gla glasses in this faith called Christianity. It's real life with real people in real time with a real God coming into all those places. And we can run this race, Lord, because you are with us. And you are not only with us, you are our strength, you are our courage, you are everything that we need to complete what Paul completed to attain that prize, to be with you forever and ever in eternity. We pray these things in your great and precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, Happy New Year. Shalom.